this is uh, one that shows a G model, and it's got the uh, blister here that's got a, a jammer in it. Yeah. Um, and we never use those uh, because if we turned the jammer on, it killed our electronic warfare, you know, our ability to, to see uh, the EW threat. Uh, and the whole time I was over there, only turned it on once. And uh, it may have saved, saved us that incident I mentioned where the Sam came by with the bad proximity fuse. Uh, I knew we were really in trouble. It was the third Sam. They'd launched two ahead of it. It was the third one. They could launch them every seven, six seconds. And uh, I called for the bear to turn the jammer on. And he turned it on, you know, when the missile was, I don't know, you know how far off it was, but it was right there. And one of the ways they had to guide missiles was, uh, you know, they are looking at your blip to guide it because it threw out any guidance from the ground. And it may have just jammed it enough that they kind of lost us at that critical point. So, so this is what the jam signal looks like on your screen right here. Oh, yeah. Good, good call. Yeah, it turns it so instead of having a nice blip to work from, it spreads it out. Uh, next one should be a four. Now that shows both the AGM 45 closest, AGM 78 a little further away. Uh, like I said, homes on jamming. Uh, it was really all we had uh, to go against the jamming. It had a 147 pound warhead, missiles 10 feet long. Uh, bad news is it's only got a range of seven to nine miles. When you're working against a SAM, it'll go 20, and your your shot will only go about that distance, uh, third that distance. Uh, that's not happiness. Um, and I think that's a notable part about that one. Um, then there's the 78. Uh, it would really reach out there. Uh, John had got some stuff that said 75 miles. I thought it was 60. But any way you looked at it, it was a big improvement. And it would uh, lock, the bear would lock it on. I'd fire it. And it would, uh, it's got a distant sight. It would actually pull up and go into a kind of a high cruise and then come over. It had a memory. Uh, so if they did shut their radar down, it would uh, dead wreck them. Uh, and part of my show and tell, that I, uh, I didn't realize until I was doing research, we, we even went through periods where they took them off the airplanes and we didn't fire them. But that missile only had about a 20% 20, 20 success rate. And sometimes you'd pickle it and it would just <laughs> no rocket motor ignite. Or nothing. Other times uh, you'd pickle it, the rocket motor would ignite, but it would uh, blow up out in front of the airplane. Well, one of the things uh, we've all heard that old story about for the, law, for the lack of the horseshoe nail, you know, the horse, you know, horseshoe nail comes off, when the shoe comes off, the, the horse can't lead the warrior into battle and all that. Well, the horseshoe nail that caused the problem uh, was this little plug. When you fired the, the missile, it jettisoned off the rack, pulled this plug, rocket motor ignites, and away it goes. Well, somebody finally realized that when we were coming home, the guys in the de-arming area were, the, the plug should have been held on that launch rack. And they, realized finally that we'd taken off with an AGM-78, we came home, and this wasn't hung on the rack. And they found that this little swage connection was coming loose. <laughs> and for the, I'll pass that around, see it. Um, <laughs> and I got uh, one of those personal things, I'll wrap this up quickly. Uh, uh, it gets into the tactics, but in 72, when I went back to the second tour, 
we started doing what was called hunter killer. And we would fly two weasels usually and then two at fours. And uh, it really worked well because we could fire an arm, it would go in, it would impact small warhead, but it had a smoke marker. Uh, and that gave us a good fix on where the site was. The F4s would carry hard ordnance, and they put hard ordnance on it, and we could put a real kill on it. Uh, the, and then the, the real added benefit was uh, they were usually F4Es. They could, uh, they were make, all those guys wanted to kill a man. And so they, they weren't too interested in dropping bombs on a SAM site, but man, they were up there and uh, they were looking for MIGs. And, uh, but it was great. We get a MIG call, MIGs are after us. We lower the nose, man, that 105 would just go like a street. And the F4s would turn and engage the MIGs. But anyway, was, I was coming down Thud Ridge one day, leaving two Thuds, two F4s. They'd usually be about 5,000 feet high. And I don't know whether the guy was busy looking for MIGs or what, but he kind of gets out in front of me. And so we're all focused on getting us a SAM site. And I pickled off that AGM-78, and it <laughs> pulls up to go high cruise. You know, and after I've been looking at the at the vector scope and all these other things, and so the missile goes away, and I look out the window. It comes off, goes into high cruise, and I knew that F-4 was gone. And it turned out it actually went behind him. He never even saw it. <laughs> I, I just knew I shut down that four. <laughs> <laughs> Would that have counted? <laughs> I never thought about it, but I don't think I'd want to put that star on the camp. <laughs> uh, a little bit about the tactics, kind of hard to read, but uh, those would get to be a pretty big gaggle sometimes by the time you get a whole uh, strike force of F-105s or F-4s there. You'd have mid cap. Uh, You'd have chaff droppers, uh, you know, so it's fun. You'd go to one of those anchors, I'll show you a refueling anchor in a minute, and it uh, would have a flight of three tankers. Every tanker's got eight airplanes on it. Uh, it's uh, a real uh, education and radio discipline, because you can't have folks do a lot of talking and they come and see them. That's about it, I guess. Um, I debated about putting training on first, but I thought I'd ought to talk about the threat first. Uh, when, and this was, as far as I know, it was kind of standard from day one in the weasel business till I left it. Uh, I never quite understood that wild weasel, you've got to be kidding me. That's one ugly weasel. Uh, <laughs> And uh, because everybody in the weasels from the start till I left it, uh, you had to be a volunteer. And so I, I didn't quite relate, but uh, that was attributed to a, a bear that was an instructor when I went through the school. And um, he had volunteered out of B-52s to this unknown program, and, and he shows up and finds, finds himself in the back seat of a 100. And, uh, I very seriously would have to tell you there is not enough money to, to, you could pay me to ride around in the back seat of <laughs> any airplane I ever flew. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, uh, those guys couldn't see out of there. Um, one of the things uh, we used to kind of joke about, you know, how that haze layer as your mock builds up, you know, and the haze layer builds, you, we've all seen the video or the things, you know, about the guys making high-speed passes. Well, the bears used to like to have that haze layer at least up to the front of their canopy because they figured if that haze layer was up there, we were going faster. <laughs> uh, I don't uh, know qualifications for the uh, 
uh, bears, but the pilots uh, have to have 500 hours uh, by the time mm -hmm. Had to be flight lead qualified, had to be a volunteer, uh, had to be recommended by your squad. Uh, part of that academic training was we went to that uh, tone lab I was telling you about. So we. So your squadron commander didn't like you. <laughs> oh, yeah, you yeah, that, that could be. <laughs> that I could be. I never thought about it. I never thought about it that way. Yeah, that's how I got it right. <laughs> uh, next. This is just a look at the Nellis training range, and if you've seen the red flag things, you've seen this. Uh, but uh, we had mobile emitters that used to uh, go outside the range area. They'd be out here at these small little towns out there, and they'd move them around at night, and we'd go back and try to find them in the daytime. Um, next, just about got it down here. Um, just a shot of refueling for the routine kind of business. I, uh, I will mention uh, the last weasel we lost, uh, I don't, it was out of my squadron. Uh, I mentioned essential to see the SAM. Uh, I, uh, he ended up, the uh, airplane wasn't ready, he was late making a takeoff to cover a night B-52 mission. He took a shortcut in the weather, uh, knowing he was in a bad place, and sure enough, uh, the SAM signal comes on, they've got a missile in the air, and he's in the weather, and uh, knocked him down. And um, where they were successfully picked up. Both of them had had previous ejections, uh, so they knew the drill, I guess. and. Uh, the interesting thing about that pickup was uh, it was the first day that the A-7s picked up the, the Sandy SAR mission from the A-1s. And we were all a little kind of nervous about how's this going to work, you know, because how's the A-7 going to stay with the helicopter and whatnot. But the guy uh, that was running that had also been shot down a few times flying the A-7, Arnie Clark. He'd been shot down flying the F-100. Arnie ended up as the airport manager at Wenatchee. I don't know if any of you, unfortunately, passed away of cancer here about four or five years ago, but Arnie just did a terrific job of holding that mission together because the weather was bad, the fences were bad. And uh, it, yeah, I was speaking when the tanker thing was on there, the refueling thing, so not necessary to change it. but. Uh, that day, I uh, I checked my form, my logbook, form five. I flew uh, just short of eight hours that day. I can't remember how many times I went back to the tanker. And finally, when they made the pickup, I was really short of gas. And the closest runway was uh, NKP, which we weren't normally supposed to land on. It was only 8,000 feet long. 105 takes a lot of runway. Uh, but a tanker came north quite a ways and gave me gas and we made it home. These are just the anchors we used to refuel on. Next, it almost got us there. This is just a 105. It's got some point outs. Uh, 105 is the uh, largest single engine fighter ever built. I don't think, any, I don't think that's changed. Um, Weighed 54,000 pounds, uh, took a lot of runway, both taking off and landing. Came down final, our lightest uh, airplane was placarded, I believe 198 on final. Jesus. That's not, it's not Jesus. kilometers. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a stubby little wing. Yeah, and it, uh, and that was, it, uh, that was recovery fuel and no ordnance. If you're bringing a missile home or whatnot, uh, and couldn't get the flaps down, you're looking like the space shuttle. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it had four speed brake pedals back there at the back end. Boy, you could put out a lot of drag. Uh, it, uh, it, it talked about getting it on the ground. Terrible 
work getting a shoot if we ever maintenance guys normally put it in but if we were someplace where we had to put our own shoot in boy it was tough because the they had made the shoot bigger <clears throat> to get us stopped and uh, so it was a 50 pound shoot of 40 pound container or something <laughs> um, That's about it. John, next next slide's John. <laughs> <laughs> Weasels. Weasels. You know that went to, that weasel picture went through the entire squadron, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we had comments and points about it. Uh, questions, I guess. You got you got time for hey, questions? questions? Dan, did you ever fly with an Ed Daily? No. In the one oh five? No. Okay. Yeah. Dan, have you been back to Vietnam? No, I haven't. No particular. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I'm sure I'd find it interesting. I just uh, fish heads and rice. Come on, yeah. <laughs> over there, Dan. Over here. Oh, Bob. Bob. Dan, um, I know that the Navy had uh, a Medal of Honor winner out of the uh, Iron Man mission, Lieutenant Eskinson, flying Naval Air Skyhawk. Uh, did the Air Force have anything similar for the Wild Weasel missions? Yeah, there were at least two. Declison was a Medal of Honor guy. Gorsmith um, was a Medal of Honor guy. Good friend of mine was shot, he was a bear, shot down in that first deployment of F 105s, shot down on his first mission. His pilot uh, was uh, so badly injured that he ended his flying career. And so he ended up flying with Declison. And on the Medal of Honor mission, and he got the uh, Air Force Cross. He never quite got over that. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I forgot to mention one key thing about pairing up. When we went to training, uh, check in on Monday, start your academics, and they tell you by Friday they want you paired up. And, and then that's how you're going to fly your combat. So that's kind of an interesting way of being assigned. Brad? Uh, for those that consider yourself humble and don't know how to say it, for those that don't know <laughs> what a bad hombre you really are, would you run through the list of the airplanes that you flew in the Air Force during your career in time? Oh, well, it's not the. It, Bud on a good weekend. Five <laughs> <laughs> more airplanes than I've been in my entire life. <laughs> No, I, uh, I started in the F-86, and then I flew F-102s, um, went to F-106s, which used the same engine as the 105, much different airplane. 106 still holds the single-engine jet speed record, as far as I know, an airplane built in the 50s. Uh, then flew 105s, then flew one, F-4s. And th those were the ones I was combat ready. In, in your current ride, sir? <laughs> well, funny you would ask if we, we would all maybe step out on the mezzanine and we would look across at my L3. <laughs> it's, going, it's going just about as fast hanging there on the ceiling as it does on a feeder.